Good evening everyone and welcome. I am Divya Gopalakrishnan and on behalf of Kerich I welcome you to our discussion today on India's plan to transition towards a greater share of natural gas. We sincerely appreciate your time in joining us for this webinar. We would like to welcome our esteemed guest speakers for today. Mr. Rajesh Medirata, MD and CEO Indian Gas Exchange. Mr. Avinash Pathak Senior Vice President and Head FCA and A ENP Domestic Reliance Industries Limited and Mr Nishan Nehru CFO AGNP Pratham This session will be moderated by Ranjan Sharma Senior Director at Carriage Ratings We will commence the session with a presentation by Hardik Shah Director at Carriage Ratings This will be followed by a panel discussion and a Q&A session In case of queries Participants are requested to key in in their panel. We will take up the queries during our panel discussion session. Now, may I invite Hardik to make his presentation, please? Thank you, Divya, for the quick introduction. This shall be the key messages from today's webinar. If you see, India has a robust demand for domestic natural gas from all the key consumption segments, which are essentially the fertilizer, city gas distribution power, refineries, and petrochemicals. Also, there is greater regulatory push for use of cleaner fuel in many polluting industries, which further enhances the demand prospects for gas in India. In this backdrop, essentially, the India has set an ambitious target to increase the share of natural gas from 6% in the overall energy mix to 15% by 2030. We have witnessed significant increase in domestic gas production in last two and a half years resulting in imports remaining range-bound. Also, higher domestic production has led to limited exposure to significant volatility in the imported gas prices, which had in fact went up sharply in FY23 on the back of Russia-Ukraine war. However, those elevated imported gas prices have also now normalized and are hovering in the range of $10 to $12 per MMBTU range, giving further impetus to the consumption of gas by the industries. Additionally, on the regulatory front, a revised pricing mechanism has been implemented for domestically produced gas from April 2023, whereby domestic gas prices are now linked to the crude prices, with a defined floor and cap providing a good visibility for the domestic gas prices. Moving to the next slide, uh, the figure on the left side of the screen depicts India's primary energy consumption matrix wherein we can see that the coal and oil together occupy more than 80% share in our aggregate energy consumption, whereas natural gas has only 6% share. The government has planned to increase the share of natural gas in the overall energy consumption to 15% by 2030. That is essentially by reducing the share of other two major sources of energy as they are highly polluting in nature. Comparing to this, figure on the right side of the screen depicts the global energy consumption matrix, whereby share of natural gas stood at nearly 20 with relatively lower share of coal in the overall energy mix due to the greater thrust over the cleaner fuel worldwide. Here we see the gas consumption trend. Uh, if we see with a greater thrust of the government towards cleaner fuel, there had been steady growth in the natural gas consumption till FY 2020. During FY21, due to the impact of COVID-19 pandemic, there had been a decline in gas consumption, which was in line with the overall decline in energy consumption in the country. However, post subsiding the impact of COVID, industrial activity rebounded and plants started operating at normal capacity, which again led to increase in the gas consumption in financial year 22. And it reached to the pre-COVID levels. Also, it was on course to grow further in years to come. However, the outbreak of war between Russia and Ukraine uh, from February 2022 led prices of natural gas in financial year 23, whereby gas lost its competitiveness to the alternate fuels. Accordingly, gas consumption declined in financial year 23, with imported gas prices normalizing to around 10 to $12 per MMBTU by end FY 23 and remaining range bound even in the current financial year gas consumption has again started its upward trajectory in nine months of this financial year, and we are expecting highest ever natural gas consumption in financial year 24. Going forward with the expected range-bound imported gas prices, growth in domestic gas production, and sizable demand from city gas distribution sector, gas consumption is slated to grow significantly in the medium term. 
Here we have given the uh, consumption trend of the gas. So in the last slide, we saw the trend for an aggregate consumption of gas on a YOY basis. Now, here in this figure on the left side, we have plotted sectoral consumption of total gas, whereby we can see that fertilizer and city gas distribution, these are the two sectors which consumes maximum gas at nearly 60% of the India's total gas consumption, followed by power, refinery, petrochemicals, and others. Going forward, also, we expect India's gas consumption to be more driven by fertilizer and city gas distribution sectors, looking at the high import dependency on natural gas for urea and nationwide rollout of the CGD network. Whereas figure on the right side is an interesting one. Here we have captured what had been the trend for the allocation of domestic gas for each of the major consumption segments. On the back of lower domestic gas production, allocation of domestic gas fertilizer for fertilizer sector has declined over last five years, whereby domestic gas allocation for fertilizer sector, which used to be at around 40% uh, of the sector's aggregate requirement in financial year 2019, has come down to around 15% in nine months of FY24 which was partly compensated by higher subsidy allocation. However, allocation of the domestic gas for the other key consuming sectors has improved over this period. Since CGD sector is one of the major consumer of natural gas, we have tried to go deeper into the CGD sector here. Figure on the left-hand side of the screen captures all the four key sub-segments of CGD. Here we can see that CNG and PNG industrial are the major demand drivers of CGD sector. Since CNG segment receives largely a major part of its requirement by way of domestic gas allocation, gas consumption in CGD segment has steadily increased over the last three years. Whereas on the back of significant increase in imported gas prices, demand from PNG industrial segment was impacted as natural gas lost its competitiveness to the alternate fuels in last financial year. Whereas figure on the right hand side of the screen shows steady growth in the CGD infrastructure in all the key four sub-segments on the back of nationwide rollout of the CGD network. And going forward, this trend is expected to continue. Now moving to the domestic production. Domestic gas production was a declining trend till financial year 21 on the back of depleting production with no new discoveries coming on stream. However, new to, however, due to new gas discoveries in few offshore fields coming on stream, gas production started improving from financial year 22. Going forward, also, we expect domestic gas production to improve in the medium term on the back of production ramp up from new discoveries along with sizable new production to come on stream in financial year 24 and 25, which we will be discussing in the subsequent slides. Here, if we see growth in the domestic production of natural gas, which we discussed in the last slide, is more driven by the private sector, because we can see here that the production by ONGC and Oil India has been declining over the last four years, whereas production from the private sector is on an improving trend. This would be more clear from the next slide. This is an interesting one. We can see here that in the last three years, nearly 30 MMSCMD of new domestic natural gas production has come on stream from the offshore fields of Reliance and BP joint venture. Going forward, around 5 MMSCMD of new gas production is expected to come on stream from the distributed onshore fields, whereas sizable 10 MMSCMD of new gas production is expected to come on stream from the offshore fields of ONGC. On the gas import side, on the back of limited domestic uh, natural gas production, India historically had high dependence on imported gas. However, for the last three years ended FY23, gas imports had declined, mainly due to improved domestic production and lower consumption on the back of rice. Going forward, gas imports are expected to increase at a moderate pace, in spite of expected growth in the domestic production, which we discussed uh, in the last slide, this is mainly because consumption of gas is expected to outpace the domestic production. Still, imports are expected to remain largely range-bound during the next two financial years. This is an interesting figure which sums up the domestic production, consumption, and imports. During financial year 21, out of the total consumption of natural gas, 53% was imported. Whereas in FY26, out of total consumption, imports are expected to be at around 45%. This is mainly because incremental consumption of almost 45 mmSCMD during this period is expected to be met 85% by domestic production. Had there been no growth in the domestic production, 
probably the dependence on imports would have been on the much higher side. Now moving to the pricing of the uh, natural gas. There are essentially two sources of natural gas, which is the domestic and imported. Domestic gas mainly comes from legacy or we can say normal fields and difficult or offshore high pressure, high temperature fields. Government had set has set different pricing mechanism for both these sources of gas. From April 23, for legacy fields, pricing of gas is linked to the Brent crude, which is in line with the recommendations of Kirit Parik committee. Whereas pricing of gas from high pressure, high temperature, difficult offshore fields continues to be linked to the prices of gas in the leading hubs. In terms of imported gas, it comes by a combination of long-term sourcing and through spot sourcing. For long-term sourcing, quantity is formed up, whereas prices are formula driven. And normally the prices experience relatively lower volatility compared to spot sourcing. Most importers of gas, uh, most importers of gas tie up a portion of their requirement through long-term sourcing and keep the balance sourcing open for spot sourcing so as to take care of any demand slowdown. Prices of spot gas are generally the highest one among all the sources of gas. In terms of IGX Indian Gas Exchange, it provides a great platform to trade quantities available from marginal fields, smaller quantity requirements, leftover quantity from the import of large consignments and excess production from the domestic fields. Also, it provides a fair discovery of gas prices based on the demand supply dynamics. Now, in terms of uh, gas, domestic gas pricing, if you see, uh, pricing of domestically produced gas till March 23 was linked to the prices of gas as various international hubs for both normal as well as difficult fields. However, from April 23, based on the recommendations of Kirit Parikh Committee, pricing mechanism for normal fields were revised and it was linked to crude prices, which is updated on a monthly basis now, with a floor of $4 per MMBTU and a cap of $6.5 per MMBTU. As we can see from the chart here, that formula-driven prices of natural gas from April 23 onwards till date have remained above the cap of $6.5 per MMBTU. However, that, that means the actual price which can be charged is only to the extent of cap, which is a $6.5 per MMBTU. Whereas pricing mechanism for domestically produced gas from difficult fields has remained the same, whereby the prices are revised on a half-yearly basis linked to the prices prevailing at various international hubs. Here we have plotted a trend of imported gas under spot sourcing and long-term sourcing along with the IGX traded gas prices. Typically, the prices of imported gas under long-term sourcing remains on the lower side compared to spot sourcing and prices of gas traded on IGX has remained in between these two prices. Post-COVID, demand for gas improved significantly and resultantly gas prices started increasing. However, on the back of Russia-Ukraine war, there was unprecedented increase in prices of imported gas, whereby the spot prices went up as high as $50 per MMBTU. However, with normalization of supply situation, prices of imported gas have got stabilized for around last one year. Here we can see the gas price discovery in the recent auctions of domestic gas and coal bed methane. Pricing formula for auctions held in April and May 2023 was linked to Japan Korea marker, whereas pricing formula in subsequent auctions was linked to the brand crude in line with the recommendations of Kirit Parikh committee. However, one interesting takeaway here is that there was aggressive bidding by the players for domestic gas allocation in these auctions, as is visible from the price discovery in these auctions remaining higher than the maximum price that can be charged for the domestic gas. It could imply that more players are interested in securing domestic gas supply for the fertilizer and CGD sectors looking at the large requirements for natural gas. With the commissioning of LNG terminal at Damra, uh, India's aggregate LNG handling capacity currently stands at 164 mm SCMD. However, overall capacity utilization was only to the extent of around 50%. LNG capacities at Dahej, Hajira, and Dabol get utilized fast, mainly due to their proximity to end use industries consuming the gas. Going forward, also, these capacities are expected to be utilized only to the extent of around 60% in coming two years' time, even with increase in imports, leaving a potential to have imports in case there is sharp correction in the imported gas prices. Accordingly, we can sum up that in terms of LNG handling capacity, India is well-placed to take care of its import requirements in the medium term, 
and in case the opportunity arises due to sharp correction in imported gas prices, the imports can very well go up. Over the last two years, there has been significant growth in common carrier gas pipeline network. India has added almost 4,000 kilometers of common carrier gas pipeline network, which is a 20% growth in network over the last two years to cover major gas consumption centers. Going forward, growth in gas pipeline network is expected to continue so as to achieve the objective of connecting the entire country through CGD network. Such growth in network augurs well for catering to the improved demand for gas. Moving to the key growth drivers, there are broadly three key growth drivers for expecting higher share of natural gas in India's overall energy mix. So let's first discuss on the demand side growth drivers. Significant network expansion in CGD sector augurs well for higher demand for gas. On the back of Russia-Ukraine war, Indian refineries are operating at peak of their capacities and likely to operate the same way in the near to medium term, leading to growth in demand for the gas. Further, many refineries have planned to add petrochemical units, which are led to incremental demand for gas. Fertilizer sector, which is the highest natural gas consuming sector, uh, with the addition of few new urea units, as well as expansion of capacities at the existing units, robust gas demand is expected even from the fertilizer sector. Apart from these key sectors, there is high government thirst to migrate few industries from polluting fuels to na natural gas due to environmental concerns. And going forward, more and more government thirst is expected towards cleaner fuel, which augurs well for the demand of gas. Now let's look at the supply side growth drivers. We have already dwelled upon the expected growth in domestic gas production and adequate LNG hand handling capacities. Apart from that, LNG export capacities are also being enhanced by gas surplus regions, which should allow more imports of gas to India. On the gas pricing front, we have a fair degree of clarity about domestic gas prices now, whereby gas prices for, from normal fields have declined, also imported gas prices have declined and have remained range bound over the last one year. Both these factors give a push to the demand for gas. Now, lastly, let's, uh, let's delve upon some of the key sectoral challenges which we see. Though there has been growth in domestic gas production, but large part of it is coming from pricier, high pressure, high temperature offshore gas fields, which pushes the blended price of the gas on the higher side for the end consumers. Secondly, though there has been decline in import dependency for natural gas over the last three years, uh, going forward, India will be still dependent on imports for meeting around 45% of its requirement, which is still a sizable number. On the back of lot of activity on the gas exploration and production side, there is shortage of drilling rigs and day rates of drilling rigs have gone up, pushing the gas production cost on the higher side. On the back of continued dependence on imports, demand for gas will continue to encounter threat from alternate fuels in times of high prices. Unlike European countries, India has very limited gas storage capacity. Accordingly, high volatility in imported gas prices will directly affect the demand. And lastly, gas continues to remain outside the GST structure, which is a long pending issue. If natural gas is brought under the GST regime, it could be a single major demand growth driver going forward. With this, I conclude the presentation here. Thank you. Over to you, Divya. Thank you, Hartik. As mentioned earlier, attendees are requested to key in their questions, which we will take up during our panel discussion session. Now, may I invite Ranjan Sharma to take over the session, please? Mr. Ranjan Sharma is a senior director, large corporate ratings at Carriage. A seasoned credit rating professional with over 18 years of experience, Ranjan has led several teams in rating operations at Carriage. Over to you, Ranjan. Thank you, Divya, for the quick introduction and Hardik for an insightful presentation. Good evening and a very warm welcome to everyone who has joined us today for this webinar. We welcome our esteemed guests for today. Our first guest speaker for today is Mr. Rajesh Mediratta, 
Mr. Mediretta has over three decades of experience in power and gas sectors, and he has played a key role in commencing the first electricity and gas exchanges in the country. Before IEX and IGX, he worked with the Apex Electricity Planning Body, Central Electricity Authority, and Power Grid Corporation in the areas of system operation and commercial settlements. Mr. Mediretta holds a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering, being a gold medalist, and an MBA in finance. Welcome, Mr. Mediretta. Our next guest speaker for today is Mr. Avinash Pathak. Mr. Pathak is a senior ENP leader at Reliance Industries Limited, and he currently heads finance for domestic ENP assets of RIL. He has total 26 years of experience in oil and gas and mining sectors, both in the business and finance roles. In the past, he was CFO of India Gas Solutions Private Limited, a 50-50 JV of RIL in British Petroleum, and he was heading the finance function for RIL's investments in USA shale gas. Welcome, Mr. Patel. Thank you. Our third guest speaker for today is Mr. Nishant Nehru. Mr. Nehru is the CFO of AGNP. With a rich experience of 15 years, Mr. Nehru has an investment banking background in the oil and gas sector with a focus on fundraising, M&A, and strategic advisory. Prior to AGNP, he worked with PwC and SBI Caps and advised numerous blue chip companies on project setup, funding strategy, and M&A, both domestically and internationally. Mr. Nehru is an alumnus of IIM Lucknow and the YMCA Faridabad. Welcome, Mr. Nehru. Thank you. My sincere thanks to our guest speakers for joining this session. I'll start with uh, Mr. Mediratta. Uh, Mr. Mediratta, we are expecting highest ever natural gas consumption in FY24, as we saw in the presentation. In this backdrop, wanted to understand your perspective as to how do you see natural gas consumption in the coming two years time in India and what according to you would be the key consumption drivers for natural gas? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Ranjan, for thanks. The, this opportunity to be part of uh, this webinar. And uh, I was very happy to see Hardik's presentation. It was like uh, he showed in a, such a crisp manner uh, the whole uh, evolution of gas market and gas sector in India and gave a very crisp view of the whole sector. And coming back to your question regarding where we see demand growing, which sector will finally be the heroes uh, in the next two years. And uh, I, I expect that uh, because since prices have now come down, as the graph was also showing, that uh, first we were uh, impacted by uh, COVID and then uh, second uh, in FY22 and 23, we were impacted by Ukraine war. And because of that, prices were high and because of that, our consumption remained stunted. But now I think uh, every sector is seeing the growth. Uh, if you see uh, fertilizer has seen the increased demand. Uh, CGD definitely is growing much faster. Yes. The power sector is also expected to grow. Probably Hardik missed one point on the demand side. That this uh, next two years and beyond that, we really will see expansion of demand of gas from the power sector. Because as everyone understands now that in power sector, we are touching, we touched last year to 44 gigawatt of peak demand. Uh -huh. This year, we expect it to go up to 256 gigawatt. Okay. And not substantial capacity, coal waste capacity has been added. Uh, rather, we have to rely on uh, the capacity which existed earlier. And of course, uh, depending on the coal supply position, uh, the demand will come on the other, uh, uh, other technologies. And uh, I think uh, even with the coal being supplied in full to the capacity which is available, we still we will need more of gas-based capacity in this year and next year. And we expect a major growth to happen from the power side. Of course, CGD will be the second one to see, to see the growth. The third one will be industries. Like uh, in last three, four years, we have seen that industries have moved to uh, alternative fuels uh, because of high prices. I think... Uh, with the prices softening to something like $8, $9. Uh, last year, as your graphs uh, showed, that it was about uh, 
maximum it was 50 55 it came down to 15 average was about 20 dollar so now this year we see the demand the prices will rule around something like under in single digit at least in the uh, next uh, six months from uh, March to say uh, September, October. So that time we will see growth uh, and uh, this industry is switching back to coming back to use of uh, gas instead of uh, the other fuels. Okay. So we will see other industries will also move to uh, use more uh, gas. And then as we go further in future, probably environmental concerns will make this demand growth happen because uh, Either we will be thinking of having something more uh, drastic in terms of carbon tax, then people will shift from dirtier fuel to uh, gas. Then from 2026 onwards, the whole world is uh, looking at additional liquefaction capacity coming up in Qatar and uh, US. Mm -hmm. So today we produce something like uh, 400 million ton of uh, gas, uh, including LNG, and expected addition is a about 200 million ton more. So it means one third of capacity we are adding in our, by 2026. Maybe it will not be exactly 200, but at least 100 million ton will be added. So okay. it is like substantial part, 25% of capacity being added. And then it will bring down gas prices to something like uh, 5 $6 to a very soft range where the gas itself will compete with imported coal. Uh, of course, uh, competing with domestic coal will be, uh, we can't say it won't it won't happen, but of course it will compete with the domestic uh, imported coal. And uh, probably then uh, all of our capacity currently, which is idling, gas-based capacity, which is idling, which is about 25,000 megawatt, that will be, that will see higher utilization. Okay. So this is my perspective. Thank you, Mr. Meridata. In fact, it was nice to have this perspective on the demand driver from the uh, gas-based power plants. And as you said, uh, going forward, we expect that with softening of prices, uh, gas prices can compete with imported coal prices. Fair enough. Nice to have this perspective, Mr. Meridata. Uh, Mr. Avinash, uh, in the past three years, we have seen that almost 30 MMS CMD of new domestic natural gas production has actually come on stream. And as we saw in the presentation, we expect nearly around 10 to 15 MMS CMD of additional domestic gas production to come on stream over the next one year. Now, what is your view on the sustenance of this incremental production as we have had a history of significant dip in domestic gas production in the past? Also, how do you see the trajectory of domestic gas production in the medium term? No, thanks, uh, Ranjan and uh, Hardik, for having me on this uh, panel. And uh, this is a pretty relevant question uh, uh, given the juncture at uh, where we are. So as Hardik was showing the incremental production that is coming is uh, mainly about 10 million cubic meters is coming from ONGC field, in uh, mostly in the KG basin. Yes, and yes, then yes. there are uh, several onshore uh, basin. So... Uh, unlike uh, in past, uh, now the uh, geology and uh, reservoir performance of these basins are very well understood. And uh, by and large, uh, companies are uh, uh, very accurately able to model the, the performance. And uh, by and large, all the companies are meeting uh, what they, they have been committing and they are delivering on, on those uh, levels. Okay. So I, I do believe that uh, sustenance should not be an issue. The onshore fields... Uh, are, are also like uh, slightly more unpredictable than than offshore, but uh, uh, because you have an ability to expand and go to a larger geographic area in in uh, onshore, and the, the business model is a very modular uh, model, in the sense that the well is uh, not very costly. So based on demand, you can very quickly add or reduce the capacity in, in the in the onshore. And that gives a, a great advantage in the sense that uh, if there is a need, uh, more wells can be added and more production uh, can be brought online even when the performance is uh, different. And then uh, with the pipeline expansion uh, to Northeast and connecting Assam and those fields, uh, okay. yeah, and those fields will also come. So I do not see any any concern on the on the sustenance. And, and insofar as the next three-year time frame is concerned, uh, uh, we would be about the same level of uh, production 
uh, with slightly increase uh, coming from uh, KG base in the field of ONGC. So that that is something which is, uh, uh, in my mind, not not a concern at, at this stage. Okay, fair enough. Now let me bring in Mr. Nehru uh, for a perspective on the CGD sector. So how do you see the allocation of domestic gas towards the CGD sector going forward? Okay. First of all, thank you, uh, Ranjan and the entire care team for having this uh, webinar at right juncture and, you know, have given us this opportunity. Our pleasure. So, <clears throat> on the allocation part, see, I think uh, when we were talking, I think in the presentation also that Hardik showed. Uh, so when we talk about domestic uh, gas right so when you talk about domestic gas you're talking about both apm as well as non-apm gas in that uh, production capacity increases yes now when we say uh, the allocation of apm uh definitely see from the last 10 year 10 odd years since this apm allocation policy has come in where cgd has been given the priority there has been a definite focus from the government also it's not just a vision statement that you know we have to increase the share of natural gas from say six percent to fifteen percent but the policy interventions are also there for all to see that you know that is a real uh, mission statement in fact that uh, they're trying to achieve so first of all uh if you see from ninth round of bidding onwards of cgd 2018 now almost the entire country is under a CGD authorization, right? And with the thrust in the infrastructure development, whether it is CNG stations or domestic connect uh, household connectivity, there is definitely increasing demand from the CGD sector per se. On the other hand, the APM production has been, uh, if not declining, but stagnant, uh, slightly declining also. So there is a pressure, obviously, on the allocation in terms of and as we continue this journey in the entire uh, country, definitely there is going to be a pressure on the APM allocation. But on the other hand, what uh, to counterbalance maybe this stress on the APM allocation, what steps have been taken are quite uh, you know commendable. One is that uh, what we slightly touched upon earlier is the preference for CGD companies on HPHT bidding, right? So once that happens, and in even in the high price regime we had that opportunity to you know participate in hpht fields and get the gas from there so that you can and most of the areas that we are developing today are new areas wherein demand conversion have to happen so at this moment as with any infrastructure you definitely need these uh, sort of policy intervention to create that uh, market at the beginning so that is one thing second with the Kirat Parekh committee also, right? Now there's a pricing stability. So mm -hmm. when you go to the market, you know for whether it's a CNG segment or domestic segment, there you know that there's a pricing stability, which gives the comfort to the end consumer also that, okay, if I'm taking a decision today to switch to a CNG vehicle or I'm buying a new vehicle, which is a CNG vehicle, then at least there's that much confidence that the prices are not going to go haywire, right? Yeah. So with these things, I think demand is going to grow up. And with the limitation of APM, definitely there is a stress on the APM allocation. But one thing I think uh, what has happened is because there's a focus on domestic household connectivity, right? So there's a full allocation to what you can, whatever you're selling to the domestic household segment, there's a full allocation on that. Yes. So that is where there's a lot of focus coming into converting all these domestic household. And if you look at it, uh, uh, there is definitely this is a long term infrastructure development that anybody is doing. So definitely these policy interventions are good. One thing I wanted to touch upon on the environmental concern also see that is going to play a major role. And because today when you go to any area where the infrastructure is not developed, right? So then you cannot pursue any industry to, you know, ask them to convert to a gaseous fuel because the infrastructure is not there. Yeah. Now, with all this uh, bidding that has happened and companies that are, you know, putting in the infrastructure, once the infrastructure is there, then it gives more handle to the local authorities also to ask for a real conversion from a solid or a more polluting fuel to a gaseous fuel. So I think that is also going to be one key important factor for uh, this uh, driving this demand. Fair enough. Got it. Mr. Meridata, so we expect natural gas imports to exhibit 
moderate growth in the coming two to three years, looking at the uh, expected faster ramp up in the domestic gas production. So wanted to understand your views, your take on the same, especially looking at the sizable LNG import capacity, which remains only partly utilized as shared in the presentation by Hartik. Do you see demand for gas significantly outstripping uh, our domestic gas production, thus leading to much higher utilize, utilization of the LNG terminal capacity compared uh, to current think, levels? Yeah, I think when in the, so if you see that uh, already 30 mm CMD of domestic gas started flowing. Yes. And uh, still we are uh, importing almost 45% of our requirement uh, uh, through LNG. So LNG is going to, because then beyond this, uh, as Avinash shared that uh, maybe 10 mm CMD more is expected from uh, ONGC and plus yes. uh, more from a few uh, mm CMD more from uh, CBM. So still we are, will not be able to reach a good uh, level of domestic gas production. Uh, so if, uh, as your graph was showing something like 212 MMCMD kind of requirement uh, yeah. uh, next year. Uh, probably for that also we'll need to enhance our uh, imports. Okay. So uh, maybe after one or two years, whatever growth will happen in demand, that will have to be met from LNG. Uh, not uh, There will not be enough uh, uh, domestic gas. And as uh, Nishant also said that actually APM gas uh, uh, volumes are declining. So mm -hmm. earlier they used to be about 45, 46 mm CMD. Now they have come to something like 41 mm CMD. And over a period as the fields will be getting older, they will decline. And then uh, we would not be able to have any other support from domestic production side. So mm -hmm. I think uh, there will be a, enough capacity. Good that we have created enough LNG terminals. Yes, LNG yes. capacity is created. 50% utilization is not bad. If you see standards, world standard, normally the LNG terminals are expected to be useful, uh, uh, to be utilizing something like 40, 40 to 50% of utilization happens. So it's okay. not that we are very too low in, uh, uh, in terms of utilization. So if we have added more capacity and with the, uh, with the more uh, pipeline connectivity, because many of the, these terminals have not grown in terms of demand because the uh, hinterland uh, connectivity is not so uh, well uh, put there so far. Okay. So as we will increase more uh, pipeline, more pipeline capacity will come, CGD network will grow, uh, and then demand from power and CGD uh, sector will uh, definitely uh, be substantial. So we expect that these terminal cap terminals will be well utilized. And whatever terminal being planned, like in Gopalpur, one being planned by uh, PLL, Crown yes. is planning at uh, Kakinada. I think uh, they are well meant. And then we may also see some uh, export of uh, LNG, maybe from these terminals to Bangladesh. I think uh, I'm not sure whether to what extent that will happen, but there is a potential there. So we should also keep that in mind uh, while we are putting our uh, LNG capacity. Oh, I think that was a nice perspective, Mr. Vadirat. Uh, Mr. Avinash, in the backdrop of sizable long-term LNG import contracts, which we saw is expiring in the near term, do you see renewal of these contracts uh, for a long-term, medium-term, or greater shift towards spot pricing? What's your take on that? So the trend uh, that is emerging, uh, essentially there are three types of trends uh, that are very visible. So, uh, as uh, Hardik mentioned, and then Mr. Medirat also mentioned about a, a very large uh, liquefaction capacity that is coming uh, yes, across yes. the world. And the, the very business model they adopt is that they lock in about 75% of the capacity in long-term contract. And that becomes uh, the bank, the, that brings the bankability to the liquefaction project. So any uh, buyers who are trying to lock in that kind of capacity will essentially be a 20-year 20, 20 uh, uh, contract. And uh, I understand a lot of buyers are still trying to lock in. I think everything up to FY28 is already gone. So okay. so anything beyond and probably a very little capacity, I think 5-10% may be left in some of the project. 
but those uh, will remain long term and, and 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 as we saw the qatar renewal with kale also was a long term yes, but leaving yes. that uh, bankability based uh, long term uh, uh, capacity rest of the capacities are tending towards being medium term uh, oh. people are negotiating more like uh, 10 year uh, and uh, and it's it's more driven by a general uh, uncertainty in the minds of users whether uh, how the trajectory of gas market would be uh, given the whole uh, discussion around uh, uh, esg and bringing new uh, going to net zero and and generally it is identified in the mind of large investors and uh, large private equity and large players that gas is the transition fuel so i don't see any hesitation in their mind in doing it but from the user side i think there is still a bit of dilemma in their mind and they are tending towards doing more like a 10 year uh, uh, of five year 10 year type of deal so that okay. they want to see how it evolves and then spot transactions are are more driven by the suppliers because they want to take advantage of uh, current uh, long uh, higher price uh, and a general belief that when the 520 in the current year 26 when the glut of uh, new lng capacity comes the prices can tend lower so they are trying to take advantage uh, by selling whatever they can through spot but the general trend is that uh, uh, it, it, it is biased towards a mid mid term uh, recontracting rather than a very long term except when they are locking in for a for a new liquefaction capacity okay now taking this discussion on the price of natural gas forward let me bring in mr nishant nehru so mr nehru wanted to understand your perspective at about at what uh, at prevailing gas prices how do you see the viability of the large cgd capex which is currently underway and at what price level do you see the png industrial demand getting impacted okay i think a very <laughs> relevant point but see i think there are two things as i think mr madhir had already pointed out and in your presentation also now the prices are softening right but coming back to cgd per se it's a infrastructure project which is a long gestation project right yes so if i start my infrastructure development today it is going to take me years before i can start utilizing effectively that uh, infrastructure and then this cyclicity of these prices we have all seen over the years right so it is not that it will remain at high levels or it will always remain at low levels right as liquefaction capacities now will come in again the prices are expected to be softened over a period of next couple of years at least so uh, at least from our perspective agv's perspective what we had you know consciously taken a call at maybe when the prices were high also two years back after the russia ukraine war that if we create enough infrastructure today again in a infrastructure project you cannot look at a return over a one year or a two year period you have to look at a return over a longer period of time Correct. so if we are able to create infrastructure at that moment even couple of years ago also so which we have done significant infrastructure has been created over the last couple of years now when the prices are right right so today when the spot is closer to say 8 dollars rather than 20 dollar now is the time when that infrastructure can be effectively utilized to cater to the market and you can create that market immediately now because if you start today then you don't know what uh, cycle of the price you will hit again after a couple of years right yes so that is one second i think one important point is uh, which i touched upon previously also is that when we talk about when we say cgd cgd in itself is you know four different customer segments one Correct. is cng second is say households households if we look at gives you sort of once you get into a household because of the sheer convenience also pricing is a separate thing just because of a sheer convenience it becomes like an annuity model right you connect to a household you can be rest assured that they are with you for long and i think for their lifetime right Correct. so you have to take that into mind and when you do infrastructure planning and development basis that then i think it will work out obviously because for domestic segment household segment there is a apm allocation available then the pricing also at 6.5 dollar it would make sense to you know for the households to convert also so i think we are in a position to 
take that uh, advantage and i think that is where you know the entire infrastructure planning has to go in a manner that you cannot take a short term view definitely it has to be a long term view on the infrastructure on your second point on the png industrial per se see definitely that is something you are dependent on mostly imported gas right yes. because uh, AP, there is no apm allocation for that right. you domestic gas also because of the mixing that for a high growth company like agnp or any of the new companies in new gs where there is a high growth there is definitely going to be apm shortfall which you have to meet whether you meet it through domestically available gas or through imports so i think one definitely from a cgd perspective uh, we don't want to get into a commodity risk so if you have to have a mix of you know spot gases long term gases some hpht also with yeah. that in mind you have a ideal mix of uh, you know portfolio of gas and basis that the idea is to convert the end consumer or the industrial consumer in your particular case or that your question was on a similar sort of a tenor that you have your gas portfolio now today when we are talking about the gas prices that we are in today to 9 dollar spot and we have some long term brent contracts also yes so if you are converting a customer who is already using a crude link or a alternate fuel which is crude derivative right yes. so then it makes sense because on energy equivalent terms gas will unlike unlike you know exceptional cases of 60 dollar you know gas or 50 dollar gas when the crude was 80 dollar that those are you know exceptional scenarios but if that is not the case in a normal course of thing energy in energy equivalent terms gas will always be competitive to a crude derivative if you're competing with that okay so therefore at a crude link price if you can offer to customer and you have that in your portfolio plus with these spot prices where we are at today so today i think we are at a good stage where you know definitely the conversions can happen secondly one point you touched upon in your presentation on you know gst it's still outside gst gas is still outside gst so that definitely is going to help in uh, you know long term but if you see and i think most of the state governments are also realizing the benefit of what cgd infrastructure development can do so if you see over last one year many of the state governments have also rationalized their uh, vat rates on natural gas okay. most recent being andhra pradesh wherein the rate has been rationalized to 5% from 24.5% okay. so definitely people including the authorities are seeing the advantage that the gas can gas economy can bring you can attract more investment if you have a industrial hub where you know you can offer a cleaner fuel and you have a gas based uh, industrial hub definitely you can attract more investment so industrial hubs per se are also you know keen to have a gas infrastructure in their industrial hub so there is a lot of uh, you know support in that regard also fair enough mr nayar mr mr mediator as you saw in the presentation that uh, the revised pricing for domestically produced natural gas from the normal fields has now been operational for close to one year with a floor and a cap now how do you see this pricing mechanism especially with the formula driven prices remaining consistently above the cap of 6.5 dollar per mmbtu yeah i think uh, uh, whatever formula credit uh, parik report uh, committee decided i think uh, that looks fine because we are trying to take it uh, uh, into consideration the 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 issues with the cgt companies because uh, cng there should be some stability of prices for cng and png okay and for that uh, whatever they have done i think uh, i'm okay with that only fine. thing is there even the mr credit parik actually Uh, suggested to make this uh, un deregulated uh, deregulate these prices after 2026 okay so by, for, from 1st april 2027 we are expecting to keep make it uh, free I, i even that i think politically will be easy or difficult that we'll have to see and nishant will not like that to actually uh, remove those limits but these limits are good enough and uh, at least for the foreseeable future i think uh, a cap will remain uh, effective because uh, uh, these uh, 
what we have done is uh, we have linked to the crude oil basket. Yes. The crude yes. oil basket, if it crude oil remains around eighty dollar or even seventy dollar, then six point five limit will be hit, and uh, it will never be below six point five. So it, there is a stability of price at least for next whatever foreseeable future. If you don't remove the limit, then probably this will continue. Uh, only thing is uh, maybe later they can think of. Uh, uh, discovering the price because maybe after okay. 2026 when they will be glut in the market if uh, suppose spot prices itself comes down to below six okay. then people will start crying that okay now you let it be free <laughs> not be linked to that formula and yes. then probably we will have to review this uh, formula again okay. mr avinash uh... I would request you to take the next question in terms of after experiencing significant volatility, the imported LNG prices for spot sourcing seem to have settled around 13 to 14 dollars per MMBTU during last one year. Uh, how do you see the movement of the spot LNG prices over next one year? So forecasting gas prices is a very hazardous uh, profession <laughs> you wanted to venture. <laughs> venture into that. Uh, I think uh, uh, the gas market uh, internationally is, uh, is, uh, uh, is uh, gradually building in the, the anticipated uh, new capacities that are coming. And this is shown in the backwardation of uh, the LNG curve. And uh, general bias is, uh, uh, at least for uh, calendar year 24, it's uh, coming down. But there are... Uh, uh, many research reports uh, and uh, good analysis that indicates that there could be a period in between, particularly closer to 25, when mm -hmm. there will be a demand supply mismatch. Because what uh, I, I don't know who touched upon uh, the parity with coal and uh, others. So there is a case uh, that uh, uh, there are certain prices in which uh, the gas can be very competitive. Uh, to replace uh, coal-fired uh, uh, capacities. Mm -hmm. And internationally, that transition may happen uh, more quicker than what, what we think. And if that is to happen, in that case, there will be a period of uh, 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 8 to 12 months when the prices can actually shoot up. But uh, barring that uh, scenario, uh, general trend is that uh, prices are coming, coming down as compared to what it is uh, prevailing today. Yeah. Mr. Nishant, uh, wanted your perspective on how do you see the threat to natural gas demand from alternate fuels as well as EVs, uh, which is significantly growing now in terms of electric vehicles? Yeah. So I think not to, you know, take it lightly, but this discussion of EV being a threat to CNG has been happening for four or five years now, right? But uh, if you see... I think they are right now competing in slightly different market, right? EV, whatever volume we are generating, one, it is more on two-wheeler side where CNG is not there, right? Okay. And also in limited pockets, right? So the dent, if you see per se on CNG, I don't think it's going to be anything major. Second, uh, now the, inf the bigger challenge, which I think probably CGD also faced long time back was, Whenever you're looking at, uh, you know, switching over from as a petrol or a diesel vehicle, you need to have the comfort of adequate infrastructure availability, right? Mm -hmm. Now, CNG was in petrol vehicles always a dual fuel. So even when, you know, in NCR, when it started, uh, people could go to a, uh, have a CNG vehicle, but if they travel long distance, they could have an option to, you know, fill it with petrol and all. With EV, you know, Purely EV, not hybrid. So with EVs, those uh, benefits are not available. So availability of infrastructure would still remain a challenge. And I think, especially on the CGD front now, because everything is authorized. So the contiguity of the infrastructure availability on the CGD size is significant. So per se, I don't feel there is going to be any major challenge from the EV side. Secondly, on uh, CNG now, if you see from all uh, industry-wide, I think there's a lot of focus moving towards LCVs, right? So these uh, light commercial vehicles, trucks, etc. are getting converted to CNG. 
which are going to be key demand drivers for the next few years. So there again, the threat of EV is significantly lower, right? So with that, I think uh, that is, and I think to some extent, these fuels can coexist also. Again, diesel, even for four vehicle, now diesel after, you know, the pricing and the more stringent norms coming in BS4, BS6, the diesel vehicle, so diesel has not been a fuel which was, you know, earlier you had a choice whether you want to go for a petrol vehicle or a diesel vehicle. Now I think the choice has become whether you want to go for a petrol vehicle or a CNG vehicle. Yes. So maybe with that, whatever market share is left, maybe EV can have some small role to play there at least for medium to long term. That is on the CNG side. On the other segment, I think today, again, I think we touched upon earlier on the household side. I don't see there's any competition right now. And with, you know, pipe gas coming to your household, uh, again, it's a perpetual, uh, you know, flow for the customer. So maybe, yes, some of these things will coexist uh, on the EV side, but not going to, you know, hamper any development plans or the growth that we foresee in the CNG segment per se. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Nehru. I think I'm sure the audience has been anxiously waiting with some questions. So uh, let's move to the Q&A session for, with the audience. So I think we have this question on, uh, I think this question, uh, I'll request Mr. Medirata to uh, Answer. So we have seen consistent growth in trading volume at IGX since it was operationalized. How do you see the trading volume at IGX going forward and what would be the key drivers for the same? Yeah, <laughs> very relevant for us and of course for the market. Uh, yeah, we expect to grow. Uh, uh, but what we have grown in last three years is something uh, more significant, but uh, maybe we will expect a growth of, say, 20, 25% uh, next year, few more years. So now, that is also subject to few conditions now being set right. Like uh, today, if you see, uh, the markets are actually not uh, so free as we uh, expect it to be. Yes. Uh, because one is that... Uh, if you look at our uh, uh, capacity uh, infrastructure access, so infrastructure access is not so open and uh, that needs to be more open. Uh, we need to bring transparency. We need to bring uh, ease of doing uh, capacity booking. Today, we need three days to book capacity. It should be within a day. Because uh, many sectors are looking at uh, uh, these changes, right? particularly power sector, because power sector, you know, now you can dispatch a power plant with notice of one hour. And okay. uh, gas-based power plants particularly are expected to operate like uh, to take care of intermittency. Now, if uh, you don't uh, have gas also available at that kind of, uh, uh, in that those timelines, it is difficult. Yes. So right. today, these two sectors are actually not in harmony. If you see power sector has done its own uh, things uh, without, uh, of course, many, not many people understand both the sides. Mm -hmm. so that is also one issue and not many people are seeing both uh, the sectors. because And that happened more particularly because power plants have, uh, gas-based power plants are largely shut down and few power plants are only operating which are, state-owned uh, uh, like NTPC and IPGCL right. and the one torrent is of course exception in terms of private sector but otherwise most of the power plants are now down so then not, not many people are crying that we need to harmonize these two sectors in terms of capacity booking in terms of the ease of doing capacity booking getting this interruptible capacity being available and then transparently all of this should be available on our website so that's one Okay. GST is another which we think uh, these, uh, we need very much because if you do trade multiple times just to take care, just to get a cheaper gas, then the taxation is more, uh, uh, you pay double taxation. And Correct. that's also not good because had there been GST, probably you would have traded multiple times to save a very small uh, money also. But now... Because since the tax itself is uh, something like 5 to 15%, uh, 
and if saving is less than that it doesn't make sense for doing to retrade and uh, retrade and churning in trade is something very big all matured markets do see churning of say 20 to 100 times okay in india we are not seeing even churn of one or two so that uh, actually is hampering uh, the market and of course uh, we need that uh, the whole capacity booking process should be uh, at non discriminate anybody who comes up with the capacity requirement it should be given there should not be any differentiation between uh, between uh, the integrated entities and bundled entities and non one so these are few things which we are we are and we are also looking for a system operator because there should be now we have expanded our pipeline network from say 24000 already we are 24000 mm-hmm. and we want to expand it to say 34000 and when you have a complex uh, grid uh, network which is from different pipeline operator i think we need a, this is the time we need a system operator because a common system operator which is neutral to all of these pipeline operations probably that will help uh, bring a better uh, environment for uh, the markets to operate so these are few things which we are looking at and uh, because without that uh, further uh, this the, the kind of growth which market wants to see because we are still 2% of the market right so if we want to grow to something like 5 6% 10% then we need all of these uh, enablers fair that's a nice perspective mr meridian i think the next audience audience question is what are the limitations in india for creating large storage capacity of natural gas so as to take care of any significant volatility in its prices mr avinash would you like to have a go at it yeah i think uh, uh, the limitations so there are i i won't say Uh, there is a technical limitation because the analogs do exist uh, externally uh, it is more that we have not applied ourselves to to solving this uh, this okay. this issue and uh, of course there is a there is a whole question around uh, whether we have to look store it in a in a natural setting or we have to construct a construct a storage for that so, uh, so it's it's more of a something which uh, probably in in developing the gas uh, market there are uh, more uh, uh, there are items which have more priority like uh, setting up the pipeline infrastructure and reaching it to all the places and expanding the cgd so this has been on the back burner but uh, this is something is a, i think uh, just like uh, lng import capacity it is it is an infrastructure of a strategic importance and sooner rather than later uh, this should come thanks i think for paucity of time uh, we'll be taking one more question uh, the last question i'll address to mr nishan so how do you see the project progress in cgd sector across various gas are they largely progressing in line with the plans or running with significant delays okay so uh very quickly so i think see i can sp- mostly speak for m- my own company right yeah, so yes. i think in general but uh, the cgd infrastructure story has been growing across gas not just agp others also i think when this 9th 10th round happened where in agp started after that definitely there was a period of covid when you know you could not do too much on the ground but maybe to some extent it was a blessing in disguise also that you could plan adequately right so you could plan in detail you could apply for permissions and all of that and then over those period i think uh, there was a and we are present mostly in southern part of the country right yes. so there was a good amount of awareness that got generated across the states also and over the last two years because see in cgd infrastructure development one of the key you know function is also of the permissions that you receive to you know lay the pipelines across various areas so definitely all the state governments have now come out with cgd policies wherein there are definite timelines ascribed to when a com- entity comes for permission what are the timeline for different department to give the permission so during those times all these things could be sorted out now i think across states there is no such issue in terms of any paucity of 
permissions that are available any paucity of you know equipments because you know there was a fear that you know now all the cgd is getting authorized will there be a paucity of you know equipment and all i think there was a time just about you know end of covid but now i think that is also mostly resolved so infrastructure development is going on at a very good pace and i think the idea would now to continue it over a next 4 5 year time so that we are able to you know connect the entire country and in that i think one of the role would also become from you know it is not just cgd right as we were talking about you know transmission pipeline so yeah. the entire grid has to be connected and you know the whole country will become like a one market if you are connected from north to south and if you have you know now unified tariff you have igx you have all these systems and processes in place so that you can take advantage of that you have the infrastructure across length and breadth of the country so gas can reach to each and every household also okay i think uh, i'll take one more question and this is from mr avinash so uh, what are your views on contribution of coal bed methane to domestic gas production india has a huge resource base but the production of cbm is very less this is the last audience question which we'll take yeah so coal bed methane as a source of gas is an uh, is an established source and uh, quite material in uh, countries like uh, australia and a little bit in uh, in in us also uh, in india it's it's a uh, it, it's a uh, i mean the te- technically i i don't think there is a lot of issue we have done it in raniganj we are doing uh, i mean uh, sr has done there and we are doing here in uh, in uh, mp uh the issue mainly is because uh, it requires far more wells as compared to any conventional uh, oil and 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 it is generally in in areas which is already habitated so the okay. whole land piece and getting the permitting uh, and all the uh, drilling the wells at all the locations uh, that becomes a kind of a bottleneck and that is something which regulators are also aware of and trying to find uh, solutions to uh and then there are more connections and pipelines so it is more of an implementation issue but as a as a source i think this is a this is a known source technical technologically there have been uh, uh, some uh, good advancements uh, like lateral drilling uh, which we are also started recently so all that will add to the productivity and uh, performance so 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 as a sector it has lot of potential and uh, this would probably continue to add to the to the incremental uh, gas in in coming days so so discovery risk is not there it is a discovered okay. it is more of a execution and bringing it up fair enough so thank you again to our guest speakers for their insightful views it was a privilege to host you mr meriratta mr avinash and mr nishan i will now hand over to divya to give her concluding remarks Thank you so much Ranjan for moderating the session and Hardik for your presentation once again thanking all the guest speakers for your insightful views it was genuinely a privilege to host you and lastly thank you to all participants for taking the time out and being a part of this carriage webinar for any further queries feedback or suggestion please write to us in the feedback email goodbye for now and i request the tech team to kindly log off thank, thank you, you.